Thank you for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'll, tr I'll try to be as entertaining as my colleague, Joel Schwartz, but I don't think I'm going to be able to meet that standard. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to give you a general outline, an overview of what is a multi-site time series study and how we tackle large amount of data to address questions related to health effects of air pollution. Um, and so uh, these are the kind of questions that I'll try to address uh, throughout my, uh, my talk and then feel free to approach me or, or the panel discussion if you have a future <coughs> additional question. So let's talk about data, okay? And so just to give like a little bit of an historical perspective. So actually this is, you know, George War started uh, this field in terms of time series studies and these it started in the 90s where some of the single, I call this a single city time series studies in the US and I <laughs> pointed out a few of them. There are many, many more, but I think this one I will consider the landmark study. And so these were uh, studies where in these particular locations, um, daily levels of particulate matters and other pollutants were collected as well as the daily number of deaths, so daily number of hospital emissions. And then uh, these studies were uh, analyzed and, 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 and published. And often uh, some of, you know, and this was like really at the beginning of providing some evidence of health effects of air pollution. And some of the critics will say, well, you have pick and choose at that particular city because of, you know, because that city is more pollutant than the other, or your results are affected by the way you have analyzed the data. And if you change the way you analyze the data, maybe the results will be different. And so there was a kind of a movement that left, that, that went from analyzing one CD at a time toward analyzing multiple CDs altogether. And so these led basically to take several national databases and then link it together to create what I will call multi-site time series studies of air pollution and health. So to give a sense of what are the major data sources that we use, uh, so the first bucket I call the exposure data. So these are daily levels of particulate matter and the other pollutants. Uh, these are maintained by the EPA. These data are uh, free and publicly available. Everyone can download. And there are several thousands of monitoring stations in the United States that measure uh, ambient level of different pollutants. Uh, as I said, including fine particulate matter and ozone and uh, um, NO2 and SO2 and so on. Then the second bucket, which is uh, always the, the more tricky one, is information about health. And what we have been doing um, is using two major sources of information. One are billing claims from Medicare, and the Joel during lunch briefly mentioned that. So in the United States, the majority, when you turn 65 years old, you're enrolled in the Medicare system, and you can buy and purchase claims that provide for every day, you know, as soon as you get into the Medi Medicare, information about uh, every time you get uh, hospitalized, when you get hospitalized, and for which disease. So these are not free data, these are not available data. You can buy, purchase the, the, the tapes, and there is a tremendous amount of data management work behind the scene to link the data in a way that we can analyze them. And then there is another source of data, which is also, I think, pretty manageable, uh, which is the weather data. It's uh, maintained by NOAA, and there are, again, several thousands of monitoring stations in the United States. You can buy the data. It's, a, it's a relatively inexpensive. And the measure um, uh, daily level of temperature, maximum temperature, humidity, and many other weather variables. And so what, what we have been doing, me and my, and my colleague, including Joel, is was to, to take all these different sources of data, there are many, many more, 
downloaded or purchased and then link it together so then we could analyze the time series data simultaneously for several hundred locations in the United States. And I'm going to tell including Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh has always been one of the cities that has always been included in all our study. And I'll tell you more a little bit. So, uh, so what is a multi-site time series study? So one of the, um, the study that I was involved in is the National Morbidity and Mortality Air Pollution Study, um, which actually didn't use, to, to, to be more precise, as, as health data, we didn't use Medicare data for this study. We use mortality data from the National Center of Health Statistics, so which unfortunately, since 2006, is no longer available to us. And that is all another story. Well, it's available to us if you call individually every single state in the United every single state in the U.S. and try to negotiate, you know, a, a, a way to get the data. But anyway, so it's, it's unfortunately will be hard to extend the study, but this is basically what we did here, and you see there is a the map uh, in the U.S., so there is Pittsburgh over there, and basically what we have, we collect daily number of deaths, as I said, from the National Center of Health Statistics, daily temperature, daily ambient of particulate matter less than 10 micron, and then develop a statistical approaches to analyze these data, both by providing estimates of health effects of air pollution within each location, but also by combining information across location to increase the statistical power and provide both estimates of regional effect as well as a national average um, effect. So that is a day, little bit more about MMAPs. Um, originally, it was 108 urban communities. We have cost-specific mortality data. Uh, so the nice thing ab about the data from the National Center of Health Statistics is that you not only have a daily number of deaths, but you have a daily number of deaths by cause and also for the entire, uh, for entire population. And as I said, we use weather data and air pollution data from uh, the EPA. So how does it work? And I'm going to spend just a couple of slides to give you an idea of how we take this giant amount of information, which is pretty messy, and try to analyze it to provide some quantification of health effects of uh, short-term exposure to air pollution, as well as all quantifying properly the source of uncertainty. So I think we, we are doing, I would like to say, in a two stages. And if you wanted to ignore the statistical words, that's fine, feel free, I'm not offended. But basically what we do is within each CD, we develop a statistical approach, so we're using existing statistical approaches really, to look at whether day-to-day -day changes in ambient level of pollution are associated with day-to-day -day changes in daily number of deaths. And that's the fundamental idea. And then we and I'll tell you a little bit more about that because you have to be careful about what we call confounding factors. So we have to be careful about other things that also vary from day to day and they could mask the association between air pollution and health. So classical example is temperature, right? So if we have a high pollution day, but you also have a very hot or very humid day, how do you know the fact that the increase in, in the number of deaths on that particular day or the day after is due to pollution, is not due to weather? So, but one thing which is really important about time series study is that because we're looking at temporal variation of pollution and temporal variation in mortality within the same city, the only thing that we need to worry about are things that also vary from day to day together with pollution and together with the number of deaths. We don't need to, and so weather is an example, we don't need to worry about smoking because the prevalence or the number of people that smoke in, a, in Pittsburgh is not going to change from one day to another day. So the, the power of time series study is that you can compare temporal changes in pollution with temporal changes in health outcome within a specific location. And so you only have to worry about 
things that could change from a day to day, but you don't need to worry about things that don't change from one day to the next. And that's really the fundamental idea and the power of the design. The second part, which is interesting and I think powerful, is that we then combine information across many locations simultaneously. And so we increase the, uh, the statistical power, but also you cannot be accused, and I'll tell you a little bit more in a second, about cherry picking one location versus another, as well as reporting the results that are more, more meaningful to you because you're doing this statistical analysis versus stati this other. Because you analyze under CD all at once, you use the same statistical methods all at once, and then you combine uh, the information. So that's what I meant by confounding bias. So that so one thing is is a more, is a weather that changes from day to day. Another important co potential confounding factor that we need to be careful about is what I call seasonality. And I'll show you a plot. Uh, so then, uh, hopefully, it will give you a better idea what what, what I mean by potential co a confounding factor and seasonality. So on the top. Uh, plot, there is uh, the uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, emission rates. So these are hospitalization rates. So these are daily hospitalization rates for cardiovascular uh, disease. And then on the bottom, there is a daily ambient level of, uh, of PM 2.5. Now, there are several lines, right? So if you look at the smoother for a moment, let's focus on, on the green line. Actually, it's not the smoother. Let's, let's focus on the green line, just because it's, it's more clear to see. And so you see there are some smoother fr fluctuation. And there is a little bit of, of general seasonality in terms of that cardiovascular emission rates go up and down through the season, as well as uh, fine particulate matters go up and down through the seasons. And so we want to remove some of the more smoother fluctuation in the data, because that could be due to the fact that these, these temporal variation vary because of, of, of season, but not because necessary PM 2.5 affect uh, cardiovascular disease. So we know, for example, that cardiovascular disease tend to be higher in the winter, and in some places, PM 2.5 is also higher um, in the winter. So in that plot right there is an estimate of the um, percentage increase in cardiovascular disease associated with uh, 10 microgram uh, in, in 10 microgram per cubic meter increase in PM 2.5, and there are many, many, many different estimates. And these many, many different estimates are different estimates of the association under different statistical models, under different way of removing seasonality in the data. The only thing I wanted to point out here is that there are actually different approaches you can use to, ways to analyze these these data. And so the question is, which one is the perfect, the right approach? Well, there is no any. And so what you need to do is to do a sensitivity analysis and see whether or not the association is consistent across the different statistical models. But one of the threat of the validity, and that was why the multi-site time series study started, was that people were accusing correctly or incorrectly investigators and say, well, you have reported these estimates, but you have to choose to analyze the data with the statistical model that provide the largest estimates, and not really with uh, a valid approach. So why we want to pool our estimates of health effects of pollution across a different different city. And so that's what I was saying. Individual cities can be selected to show one point or another. Results from individual cities are much more sensitive to the assumption that you're making in terms of analyzing these uh, data. Sometimes you don't have enough data. You don't have enough information in a single city. But you could think about that makes perfectly sense to borrow information from neighboring location, also because air pollution travel. And so it, it, I think it's reasonable to, to think that how pollution affects health in a, in a neighboring city could be informative of what happened in, um, in, your, uh, in your own city. So, uh, so pooled estimates from multi-site time series study gave you a very consistent, I would say, and robust measure of the association between short-term effects of pollution on health. 
Um, and what doesn't provide, though, it's important to make this, uh, the following distinction. What time series study does is uh, give you an information about what, what is your effect on health associated with short-term exposure to pollution? So if pollution levels have been increasing from one day to another, what's going to be your increased risk on the same day or maybe the day after or two days after? Doesn't give you information about if I live in a city for a very long time and I have a long-term exposure on pollution, am I have a higher risk of mortality? There is another type of studies which George was mentioned and in this morning was mentioned like the Harvard Six City Studies or the American Cancer Society Studies. These are cohort studies where we follow people over time. Now the problem with that study on the other hand that you have to compare population across different cities. And so there is always the criticism that how you make the life experience in one city comparable to another city. So these studies are, I would say, more robust in terms of confounding bias because look at temporal association, but only capture what I would say the tip of the iceberg in say of whether short-term exposure to, uh, this, to um, air pollution in increase your, um, your risk on the same day on the day after. This is a, just a plot to show, uh, and I'm not, I'm not gonna spend much time, actually, I'm just gonna skip that. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's gonna take time to explain it, but it's behind the point. Now, what is the difference between a meta-analysis or multi-site time series study? So, we often talk about meta-analysis, and uh, for people that are not familiar with a meta-analysis, basically what you do, you take published results from the literature and you pull them. And you combine them and you try to get an overall summary of what has been published in, in the literature and it's a really powerful approach. One of the problems with the meta-analysis and sometimes that has been pointed out is that it's affected by publication bias. So people tend to publish more results that are positive. So what we did in this, uh, um, in this paper we did a side-by-side side side comparison between a, a multi-site time series study and a meta-analysis. So here are uh, ten, one, two, four, yeah, eight cities, and for each of these cities, there was a study published in the literature, in, and this was an, an independent, single-site study of air pollution and health, <laughs> but this CD was also included in our multi-site time series study. And again, because we did, we did a multi-site, we analyzed all the CD using the same statistical method. So we can show different results depending to different statistical methods. So you see, for example, that the, the percentage increase in mortality for 10 um, PPB increase in daily ozone was of around 1.4 when you use data from Chicago, and this is, it was a paper published in the peer-reviewed literature using only Chicago as a study, versus the estimates that we found in Chicago by using for the analysis for the data in Chicago exactly the same statistical model that we use for all the other cities. So it's a, it, it, it is a little bit more systematic, and by definition, it's not going to be affected by by publication bias, and that's our, I mean, Chicago is where we see the most drastic differences, but this is also what's interesting. Basically, this is shows they pull the estimates, so the uh, overall estimates of the health effects of pollution on, on mortality. This one is called posterior distribution. So basically what he's saying is that how much the, the data support a, a value of the relative risk between zero and 0 0.5. And you see that in multi-site time series study, you tend to get a more conservative estimates than the estimates that you get from uh, a meta-analysis. So it's, it's more conservative and it's less affected by the, by the very, the, you know, the, the tempting uh, situation of publishing a paper under the statistical model or under this scenario, they give you the <laughs> largest effect or a statistical significant effect. And the similarly, this is a, a similar comparison. The other thing that was mentioned this morning is the issue of lag. And that's something that we struggle all the time in terms of are you reporting the relative risk of mortality associated with the same day of exposure or one day exposure or one, one day lag or two, two, 
two day lag. And now I think has been consistently accepted in the epidemiological literature to report uh, the percentage increase in mortality associated with like three, three days ago exposure or two days and so to, to provide the full information. But when we did the, this, this study, it was interesting that we compare studies that they report only one lag versus the study they report all the all the all all the the different lags and there's the, in the study they report only one lag always have a much higher estimates than the one they reported the full spectrum really suggesting that people tend to report the estimates at the lag from which the effect was um, was stronger so what are the benefits of multi-site time series study? And I think now they're pretty well accepted. There are many, many, uh, both in the US and also uh, both in, uh, in Asia and in Europe. Basically, you can increase statistical power because you can aggregate multiple estimates. estimates. And also, one thing which is very important, which I'm not going to be able to touch much uh, in this presentation, but also the possibility of exploring heterogeneity of the relative risk estimates across the different location. So when you, by analyzing many cities at once, you're going to have it in some places so the effects of pollution is higher than in other places. And then you want to ask the question, why? And, and so this, there is a, like a, a very large uh, literature on try of look what we call the uh, effect modifier of the uh, health effect of pollution. So let me give you some summary of the evidence of the multi-site time series study I've been involved to, uh, acknowledging that there, are, there is many more, um, more out there. One of the first multi-site time series study, um, and this is, was the first paper published as part of the National Mortality, Morbidity, and Pollution Study, used only 20 cities, and Pittsburgh was one of them. Uh, and um, this one was looking at the percentage increase in mortality associated with same day exposure or one day exposure or one day before exposure to PM10. And what this plot shows, again, uh, this is how much the data favor a values of a relative risk of between 0.2 and 0.4. And you see most of the most of the support from the data is around an estimate as, a, as a something like 0.3. So what this is saying that for a 10 a microgram per cubic meter increase in PM10, yesterday I have a 0.35% increase in, uh, um, in mortality. The largest effect comes from uh, cardiovascular and respiratory, uh, respiratory deaths. Uh, at that time, one of the critics uh, was that, well, how do you know it's due to PM and it's not due to other pollutants? And so in this analysis, this was really the first multi-site time series analysis that we published, we reported the effect of PM10 adjusted by other pollutants. And you see that although sometimes you lose uh, some precision about how big the risk is, but clearly uh, the results are very, um, are very consistent. One thing that I thought that, that you might be interested in was estimates of the short-term effects of PM10 on mortality by geographical regions and by season. And so what this plot shows is uh, how this relative risk of mortality associated with PM10 change over time by season and by geographical regions. And again, I'm pointing on the Northeast region. I think we have been seeing pretty consistently that the largest effects are in the Northeast. Um, and also that the effects tend to be higher in the summer in the Northeast part of the United States. The seasonality, I think I, I could say overall, if. Uh, health effects of PM10 on cardiovascular mortality and morbidity tend to be pretty consistent highest in the Northeast part of the United States. Although I think the seasonal effect are not completely consistent across studies. So in this study, we found in the Northeast it peaks in the summer, but I'm not totally confident that that is something that has been consistently reported across so many other multi-site time series study. Now, for, for the Medicare data, this was um, really more recent uh, analysis that 
um, many of us have been involved in. So using as a health outcome, billing claims from the Medicare. And this is very powerful because uh, basically over 90% of the population older than 65 is enrolled in Medicare. And so you have a pretty good assessment of an understanding of, of the health status, in this particular case, hospitalization data, for the majority, for the great majority of the population of uh, uh, over, over 65. So there are 48 million people. You have, what well, we have information is the data service, so they, 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 that they appear and they have a, an hospitalization record. We know for which disease they are admitted, we have age, gender, and race. And very important, we have the place of residence by zip code. So we can link health data to our pollution data by the monitoring, uh, monitoring location. And so to give you an, a, an idea, this is one of the study we reported. So we identified up to 204 counties. And again, your favorite county and city is included in the study. Uh, these are uh, counties with population larger than uh, 200,000. 200, and so includes uh, approximately a quarter of the entire um, Medicare population. Now, the reason why we don't include it all so why 11 million and not 14 million? Well, because in this particular study, we only use the people, the county, they have a very good pollution data measured by the monitoring network. However, now they, we're getting so much better in predicting exposure to air pollution in other areas, for example, including satellite data, as uh, um, Joel mentioned it. And so we will be able pretty soon to start studying other population that don't have, don't live close to a monitoring, um, an air pollution monitoring network. So one thing that there has been a, a shift of attention from health effects of PM10 to health effects of PM2.5, because PM2.5 are smaller particles with the idea that they will tend to penetrate deeper into the lung and you have harder time to get rid of them, so causing inflammation. And so we did a study using the Medicare population, the cohort I just showed you, to look both a short-term effect of fine particular matter and short-term effect on, on coarse particular matter, which is the PM of the size between 2.5 and 10. Um, so these are pooled estimates across all different, across the 204 counties in the United States. But what we did, we stratified and, and take uh, differently the, the part, uh, just looking at this for, yeah. So we kind of cut the US in two parts, and we look at the facts of fine and coerce for this part, which we call the West and the East. I know it's a very coarse uh, distinction, but it was important because we do know, and I'll tell you in a second a little bit more about that as well, that the chemical composition of particular matter, it's dramatically different in the west part of the United States versus the east part of the United States. So what, this, what these uh, estimates show is that these are the um, average effect, meaning the percentage increase in cardiovascular hospital emission records um, the, the, um, the black dots are for the counties in the east part of the United States, and the empty dots are for the county in the west part of the United States. And here are different cardiovascular disease and different respiratory diseases. So what you're seeing is overall, oh, and I'm sorry, this, this first is for injuries. So we try to use like a sham outcome, so which are false, thinking that you will expect that air pollution is not going to increase uh, the risk of falling down the stairs or other injuries. So, and in fact, we don't see an effect, actually even a protective effect. So what you see here is that a 10 microgram per cubic meter increase in PM2.5 increases your risk for hospital admission for cardiovascular disease for different diseases. This is a, a cerebrovascular disease, a peripheral disease, ischemic heart disease, a heart failure, pretty consistent in the east part of the United States. When you look at the west part of the United States, the fat of fine particulate matter is actually on cardiovascular disease 
it's not there, we don't see any effect, where we do see an effect on hospital admission for respiratory diseases. When we look at the uh, same type of association, but not for fine particulate matter, but for coarse particulate matter, so the larger particle, we actually don't find uh, the same strength of association, <laughs> kind of providing uh, data to and support to the hypothesis that the fine particulate matters are more harmful to coarse particulate matter, and they tend to be mostly harmful for cardiovascular disease and mostly on the east part um, of the United States. Now, just to finalize and just talk to you a little bit more about, well, what is in the composition, in the chemical composition of particulate matter that is more toxic? That is now the, I will call it the hundred million dollar question. Uh, everybody in our pollution epidemiology is trying to address that question. Do we have an answer? No. I'll tell you a little bit of some of the recent results, but I think there is still a lot to do there. So just to give you a sense of how the, the data looks like and what are the type of things that, that you can do. So first of all, um, there are, um, actually, let me show you the maps first, right. So, so th there is the EPA starting the year 2000, it started to monitor not only PM 2.5 as a total mass, but also up to the 52 chemical constituents of PM 10. And so what this, this shows, this map shows, are actually are the location of the several hundred monitoring stations in the US they measure all the 52 chemical components of PM, almost, well, it's not daily, it's most of the time is one every three, three, three days or every six days. So you can see actually there is a tons of data and in your region of interest, it's a heavily, heavily monitored. So what this map shows, for example, is the concentration, the average concentration of elemental carbon in the particulate matter, that's the sulfate, that is a just you know, a measure of, of silica. And you can see, for example, that sulfate is so prevalent in the East part of the United States and in the West. <laughs> this is just to say two things. One is that we are now measuring chemical components of PM2.5 across the US. And two, that the chemical composition of particulate matter changed dramatically across the US. And ideally, what we would love to be able to say is, well, in one region, the fats of pollution is more harmful than in another region because in that region, we have this chemical composition of PM, where in another region, we, um, we, we don't. So uh, actually, I skipped. Right, so, um, so this is our, what we decided to do is although chemical components of PM2.5, there are, although we measure 52 chemical components, we decided at least at the beginning of the analysis, but other investigators have done much more general approach, is to focus only on the se seven major components. Uh, and these one explain up to 85% of the total mass. These are the bigger one. That doesn't mean that they're the toxic one. You could have a metal that is a, a very small percentage in the particular matter, but could be highly, um, highly toxic. And so to just show you basically what we have done, keeping the idea of multi-site time series study, is to construct a database of time series data for over the 52 chemical con constituents, uh, for over 250, uh, we call it speciation trend network, which are the one that measure the chemical component. Uh, we identify the subset of the PM 2.5 component that we wanted to study, and then we have linked the the two sources with Medicare data <coughs> to try to investigate the question which of these seven chemical components tends to be more highly associated with the, the uh, respiratory, sorry, the, with the uh, hospital admission for cardiovascular disease. So in one of the studies that we published, and I should say there are many other studies and they tend to not to be completely consistent, and so that's why this is one study that pulled data from 180 counties, but some other study might say something slightly different. But basically what we show here are the national average estimates and the 95% um, confidence interval of the percentage increase in the cardiovascular emission rates associated with same day exposure or one day lag or two day uh, increase 
in each of the chemical components. And what we found um, in, uh, in our investigation, the elemental carbon and organic carbon matter, they are the components that are mostly combustion uh, created. So that's what also Joel was mentioned today, traffic exposure, power plant exposure, tends to be the, more, the one that are more responsible for the health effects that we're seeing on PM2.5 and cardiovascular emissions. So I'm just gonna give some concluding thoughts. Uh, I think that there is, is now, well, first of all, I think now that is very well accepted that short-term exposure to fine particular matter is associated with mortality and hospital admission, as well as with many other diseases. I think that it's pretty well accepted in the community. I also think it's very well accepted that short-term exposure to PM 2.5 tends to vary by season and by geographical regions, as well as the chemical comp composition of PM 2.5 might play a role, an important role, in the toxicity uh, associated with uh, air pollution. So some of the sources and components are more harmful than the others. There is now really a variety of epidemiological studies and statistical approaches. They are trying to look into that question. Some are try to reconcile and be consistent. Some others tend to have results that are pretty much um, you know, different. And it's also true that this is a really complicated issue so because also you might expect that the chemical composition of, of fine particulate matter might play a different role regarding which health outcome you're looking. You're looking at cardiovascular outcome, you're looking at respiratory outcome, <laughs> you're looking at birth outcomes. And so the entire picture gets by far um, more uh, complicated. I think that's all, thank you. We're just running a few minutes behind schedule, so I still would like to break for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, again, we build in a little bit of extra time, so we still anticipate wrapping up by 